important. Uh, you know, lots of people are working, lots of nice results are coming out. And Professor Ken Ono is one of the, uh, you know, main person who has really brought, you know, if I am not wrong, uh, he's the person who has really motivated by his path breaking results in, in, in integer partitions in mock theta function. We just, in the morning, we had Professor Catherine Bringman, their work is, uh, you know, one of the path breaking work in the area of uh, uh, mock theta functions. And uh, he has received many awards. And uh, so 2000, he received the presidential, um, American Presidential Career Award, 2005, NSF Directors Distinguished Teaching Awards. He won Sloan Fellowship, Packard Fellowship, Guggenheim Fellowships, you know, plenty of such, you just go on. He has more than 2000 research publications already. And uh, just outside that, he is a fantastic teacher all over the globe. People know about Professor Ken Ono and young students. He's really passionate about grooming the young students. Many Indian students do go, and Ken has helped many of them to really come up as a mathematician successful in their life. And outside that, of course, he's in the editorial board of many, many journals. He has started two journals. He's the chief editor of those two journals. And outside that, he's a cyclist, he's a runner, he's a swimmer, and he was in the triathlon team of US. US team. So this is just to name a few and just be, we are excited to hear Professor Kenono. Professor Kenono. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, you're too kind. Uh, I'd, I'd like to begin by uh, saying again that I wish I could be with, with you celebrating Michel at, uh, for his many, many contributions uh, to our field, both scientific, both cult and cultural, and in, and, and in particular, being an iconic figure for uh, making mathematics popular to the entire world. And so uh, my feeling is we have to do this again uh, uh, when, when the opportunity presents itself so that we can actually get together in person. So this lecture today is um, uh, the result of joint work uh, with my PH, one of my PhD students, Hassan Saad and uh, uh, an Indian postdoc. She's presently here at the University of Virginia, enjoying a Fulbright fellowship. Her name is Neelam Saikia, and I'm delighted to say that her PhD advisor, my friend Rupam, uh, was the previous speaker. And so, uh, you know, for those of you who are perhaps writing your PhDs in India and would like to have an adventure post-COVID, I encourage you to, to apply for things like the Fulbright Fellowship so that uh, maybe you could join us for a short period of time. It's, uh, I think we should soon be returning to a period where there's more collaboration because, uh, well, hopefully post pandemic, the pandemic will no longer serve as, a, as an obstacle. <clears throat> In any event, the lecture I want to give today is very new work. Uh, it's on Sato Tate type distributions for hypergeometric varieties. And if you don't, haven't studied very much about these, these sorts of questions, <coughs> pardon me. Uh, uh, I, I hope to give a, a survey that quickly leads up to some very beautiful mathematics. The subject of this conference is about mathematics related to class numbers. And although it won't be apparent for the first half of this talk, what's really driving all of the results in, 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 in this paper that we've written uh, involve the very class numbers that we love, the class numbers related to imaginary quadratic orders. So let me begin with an example. Let's consider this elliptic curve, y squared minus y equals x cubed minus x squared. And, uh, and let's define for primes p, a number a of p here shown here in red, which lives in the interval between negative two root p and two root p, is to find a of p to be p plus one minus the number of points on this elliptic curve mod p. There are only finitely many primes of bad reduction. So in, in, in terms of the picture I'm about to show, they don't matter. So for every prime p, you could consider this sequence of numbers generated by them. If you normalize the numbers a of p by dividing by two root p, right? a of p lives in this interval. And so if you divide by two root p, you end up getting a real number between negative one and one. If you assemble a histogram that locates where these ratios are, uh, you end up getting a picture like this if you consider all the primes up to 10 to the ninth. 
And if you try to imagine or guess the outline of the curve that is cut out by this, well, the natural guess would be, given this data, that you're cutting out the boundary of the, the curve y equals 2 over pi times the square root of 1 minus x squared. Namely, it's a squashed semicircle. And if you're wondering, are there, is this a difficult way to find the squashed semicircle? Well, it turns out that you would be uh, reinventing the famous conjecture of Sato and Tate. You see, Sato and Tate in the 1960s made the following postulate, hypothesis, following conjecture. Suppose that E over Q is an elliptic curve without complex multiplication. And for a prime P of good reduction, define theta P now to be a slightly different thing, define theta P to be an angle between zero and pi such that A of P is given by two root P times cosine of theta P. This is a mild renormalization of what we did a moment ago. And then what they conjectured is that if you pick any pair of real numbers in the interval from zero to pi, say alpha less than beta, and you literally count the number of primes up to X for which this angle lives in the sub interval alpha beta and divide that by the number of primes up to X. So this is computing the proportion of Frobenius angles in a subinterval. As x goes to infinity, they conjectured that this converges to 2 over pi times the integral of theta uh, times the integral of sine squared theta over the interval from alpha to, alpha to beta. <coughs> this was an open problem for quite some time, and uh, largely due to the work of Richard Taylor and his collaborators. This is now known to be true, and this is what's called. Uh, the Sato-Tate theorem now for elliptic curves. So in a funny way, this very, very deep mathematics confirms that you could use elliptic curves to discover the, uh, the upper half semicircle in a very sophisticated way. Of course, that's not the goal, it's the other way around, but that's one way to think of it. <clears throat> there, what is the aftermath of this very big work? The aftermath is that it is now known that the Sato-Tate conjecture holds for elliptic curves over totally real number fields. We don't just have to study elliptic curves to find over the rationals. The same conjecture holds if you define an elliptic curve over a real field. What is the role of the elliptic curves in, these, in, in this theorem? Well, my friend Drew Sutherland has some further results about abelian varieties. If you want to calculate how many points there are on abelian varieties low, of low dimension mod P, compute some statistics and let P go to infinity. Uh, he has a few theorems uh, and, a, and a wealth of conjectures indicating that the Sato-Tate original conjecture is the beginning, just a glimpse of a whole, a whole kingdom of conjectures. If you're interested in modular forms where we don't have to worry about whether a higher weight modular form corresponds to an, a variety that we can write down, like is the case of elliptic curves, well, the same theorem is known to be true for higher weight forms, again, through the work of Taylor and his collaborators. Well, and in the case of modular forms without, with complex multiplication, similar theorems hold, but the formulation is very different and is dictated by uh, that theory. So to make <clears throat> um, an obvious statement, all of these works, all of these works are, are relatives or descendants of the original proof of Fermat's last theorem by Wiles, where the whole point was to prove that some Galois representations associated to elliptic curves are modular. And that's the beginning of a story. And what Taylor and others are now doing is that they're studying what are called the potential automorphy of symmetric power L functions, symmetric squares, symmetric cubes, where the original work of Wiles is really just about the first L function that one begins with. So make no mistake, this is, this is about as hardcore and deep as mathematics gets in this area. And so uh, this is not for me. Uh, I, I, I marvel at these great theorems. Uh, for someone like me who spends a lot of time wondering, I ask uh, an orthogonal question. So the questions that I wish to consider are even more basic. I tried to imagine what was in the mind, what was Sato and Tate, what were they thinking when they made their original conjecture? Of course, there was no modularity of elliptic curves at their, in their day, 
all this fancy machinery proving these great theorems didn't exist. So maybe if we go back and ask and try to put ourselves in the shoes of uh, people like Sato and Tate, maybe we can find some, uh, some other directions in which we can pursue these kinds of questions. So the first question is, are there analogous results for other varieties? Another question you could ask uh, is, are the distribu distributions one generally gets, are they generally semicircular? If not, how exotic can these distributions be? Frankly, I think it would be very disappointing if in the, hist if, if in the, uh, in the universe of all varieties, all the theorems ended up producing the semicircle or the squash semicircle. That would really be rather disappointing. And in particular, uh, I would like to know, are there structural frameworks that could explain answers to these questions, which go off in a different direction uh, than that obtained by uh, potential automorphy of symmetric power of L functions? <coughs> so it turns out you don't have to look very far to begin finding situations where the answer is yes to all of these questions. And, and so the, the goal in in this talk is to discuss what you can find by studying hypergeometric or the so-called Picard-Fuchs varieties. So uh, if you've never studied Picard-Fuchs varieties before, you won't need to for the purpose of this talk. Let me just get out there this vague definition that is as follows. A Picard-Fuchs equation is a linear ordinary differential equation whose solutions uh, describe periods of Calabi-Yau varieties. If you don't know what that means, uh, let, let's focus on the hypergeometric part. You see solutions to differential equations can often be found in families and dictated by hypergeometric functions. So let me give you examples of these Picard-Fuchs varieties without using any fancy language, but appealing to special functions. So the classical hypergeometric functions are, are, are rapidly convergent power series, say in a variable X, that take this shape. So suppose you have H complex numbers called the alphas, J complex numbers called the betas, then the H, F, J classical hypergeometric functions in these parameters would be this power series in X. What are these funny symbols? These funny symbols are called Pockhammer symbols. And what they are is that they are analogous, well, they are just rising factorial functions. Gamma sub n for a positive integer n is gamma times gamma plus one, all the way up through gamma plus n minus one. These are the product of n consecutive values increasing by one when you start at gamma. So it won't come as a surprise that these hypergeometric functions satisfy very nice uh, differential equation properties because of these factorials. And so let me give you some instances, uh, very famous instances that uh, you'll discover if, if you haven't seen this before. You'll discover them by reading texts, uh, the first texts on, on these objects. So one of the most famous theorems goes back to Gauss. And what Gauss proved is that if lambda is real between zero and one, then the two F1 in these parameters evaluated at lambda is one over pi times the real period of this Legendre normal form elliptic curve. So as you vary the real number lambda from the theory of elliptic functions, you get that this elliptic curve is C mod a lattice, thereby given by periods, C mod periods that generate the lattice. And one of the famous theorem, first theorems in this field is that Gauss's two F1s give the so-called real periods of this family of curves. Now, as delightful as this example is, you might be led to the, the conclusion that it's easy to find periods of elliptic curves uh, from hypergeometric functions. Uh, I wish that was the case. If that was the case, uh, we would probably be in, in a, a better situation than we are today, but it is not the case. And so to emphasize that, let me show you this recent theorem of McCarthy from 2010 that says that if lambda is a positive real number, and if we consider the Clausen elliptic curve, which doesn't look very different from the Legendre form, it's x minus one times x squared plus lambda on the right, that is the cubic. And then McCarthy proved that the classical hypergeometric function with three and two parameters, evaluated at lambda divided by lambda plus one, 
is up to this normalization, the perfect square of the real period of this curve. And so uh, it's, it's very tricky. People like Rupam and others have certainly obtained many theorems along these lines. Uh, but for the purpose of this talk and for the purposes of studying uh, uh, some, perhaps the first examples of real periods, I offer you Gauss and this beautiful theorem of McCarty. So when we say that an, uh, a variety is a Picard Fuchs type, in your mind, you should be thinking that in the background, there are formulas like this. So in this talk, I wanna consider three families of varieties. I've shown you two of them already. The Legendre form elliptic curve, the Clausen elliptic curve, and I'd like to now show you a similar variety, a larger dimensional variety, a K3 surface, uh, that I studied with uh, my former postdocs, Algren and Penniston many years ago. So for <clears throat> rational numbers lambda, apart from zero and minus one, let's let X lambda be the K3 surface whose function field is given by this equation. S squared is this polynomial in X and Y. It's a surface and the, the role of the parameter lambda much like the role of, of lambda in the case of the elliptic curves above, appears in the defining equation, and in this case, it appears right here. So uh, never mind what a K3 surface is. Let me tell you everything that I want you to know about it here. <coughs> in terms of modularity, it turns out that some of these K3 surfaces are modular, and I'll explain more of that on the next slide. Uh, but it says, our theorem says that for these few values of lambda, when you plug in those numbers, this variety is modular, meaning that there's a modular form underlying its arithmetic, very much like modular forms underlie the arithmetic of all elliptic curves over Q. For K3 surfaces, it's not, it's not universal, it's very rare, and that this set is finite gives you an indication of how rare that is. For all the other numbers lambda, this K3 surface is not modular. It has what's called Picard number 19. Uh, if you don't know what that means, let me give you a glimpse of what that means on the next slide in terms of the local zeta function for this variety. So in number theory, uh, before there was ever modularity and things of that sort, we were primarily first interested in just counting. We do number theory, we count numbers. So if you wanna count the number number of points on a variety over a finite field with fixed characteristic, the theory of the zeta function gives you the generating function for the number of FQ points on a variety, where FQ is any finite field with a fixed prime characteristic. And so the corollary that I want you to know <clears throat> is that we can compute the local zeta function for these K3 surfaces in this way. What's very nice about our very special equation is that the zeta functions, which are always rational functions in T, what's very nice about the, the rational function for this K3 surface is that a large factor of the denominator seems to have nothing to do with lambda. Independent of lambda, you get this large degree 21 factor in, in the zeta function. So the problem of computing the number of points on a finite field of this K3 surface but with fixed characteristic P boils down to only two pieces of information. It looks like it boils down to three pieces of information, um, but as I'll explain, it really only boils down to two pieces of information. What are pi and pi bar? They are algebraic integers that are Galois conjugates, whose trace lives in the same Hasse bound that was required for the A of P's in the theory of elliptic curves. And just like you have for elliptic curves, it turns out that the product of pi and pi bar equals P. So if this were a modular elliptic curve, none of this stuff to the left would exist. There would just be the zeta function, which is a degree two polynomial, where instead you would have pi plus pi bar and uh, what we don't have, and you would have a P here, uh, but for this K3 surface, it's a little bit more complicated, but not much more so. <clears throat> what does it mean to be modular? Well, if you were to consider the L function that is obtained by the infinite product of these red factors, 
after replacing t by p to the minus s, right, which is analogous to what you would do for elliptic curves. So take an infinite product only over these red terms after replacing t to be p to the minus s. Being modular means that the resulting L function is a weight three modular form, in fact, with complex multiplication. And that would be what it would mean. So why do I want to talk about this particular K3 surface? The reason I want to talk about this K3 surface is that uh, if you've never studied symmetric power L functions before or higher power L functions, the symmetric square is very much like what you would get from this red component. And in particular, it also has a delightful property that for a handful of values, you make intersection with the theory of modular forms. And so, as I mentioned before, I want to study Sato tape type questions, but in an orthogonal direction. And this is a situation of a variety, which has some features that you would need in Taylor's work. And it intersects somewhat with the kinds of ideas that um, others have already used, but only finitely often. All right, so let's, let me take a brief detour and say that these varieties are actually particularly remarkable. That those three families of varieties have the property that their periods come from classical hypergeometric functions, but they're even more remarkable that these zeta functions also come from hypergeometric functions, but from a different type of hypergeometric functions. The Gaussian hypergeometric functions introduced in the 80s by a mathematician named John Green. So suppose you have characters, the A's and B's on a finite field. These are just homomorphisms from the cyclic group, the cyclic multiplicative group of a finite field to C. So what you can assemble from these characters is a power series, which is sum over all the characters of your finite field in this way. This is a function in X. We're summing over the characters in X, and because the, the, the characters of a, of a group are independent, you can write down every function as a power series in, um, in the values of these characters at a fixed x. What are the coefficients in these hypergeometric functions? They are these symbols that look like binomial coefficients. And for many reasons arising from analogies between Gauss sums and gamma functions, uh, you Green recognized that these binomial coefficients, which are normalized Jacobi sums, play the role of the Pockhammer symbols I described earlier, the ratio of the Pockhammer symbols I described earlier in the classical hypergeometric case. So the beautiful thing here is that if Q is odd, we're studying finite fields, if Q is odd, there's always gonna be an order two character, which we will denote by phi. There's always for every group a trivial character, which we denote by epsilon. And for simplicity, I'm going to define n f n minus one of lambda to be this hypergeometric function of green. And this is where the magic happens. I like talking about this before leading off with our results, because perhaps the most important part of the, our talk, my talk here today, is uh, advertising these analogies. So there's a very beautiful arithmetic geometric mantra for Picard Fuchs varieties. And it is that the classical hypergeometric functions that give the real periods, if you just naively replace all of the parameters by the corresponding characters whose orders are the denominators of the, of the parameters above, you should get a relationship that gives and returns the, the local zeta functions for exactly the same varieties. Literally replacing a classical hypergeometric function where the halves are replaced by order two characters should tell you how to both capture real periods as well as the local zeta function. <coughs> so to prove this, Green already knew this. For the Legendre elliptic curves where we had those real periods, his function evaluated lambda gives the trace of Frobenius. Q plus one minus the number of FQ points of the same curve. And for the K3 surface, I proved with Algren and Penniston that the number of FQ points on the K3 surface is given by a 3F2 function, the same 3F2 function that cuts out its periods under the Abel-Jacobi map. 
<coughs> but it's even better than that. What you might not have foreseen though, is that the same three F2 functions that arise here that count the number of points on the K3 surface is the square of the trace of Frobenius for the Clausen elliptic curve, which is an arithmetic geometric statement, um, which is something like studying a Coomer surface covering of an elliptic curve. So just to see the mantra in action, let me remind you, McCarthy and Gauss prove these functions give real periods. And if you do exactly what I say, pi times two F1, the pi plays the role of Q, Q times two F1 in the finite field gives trace of Frobenius. For a K3 surface, I prove this, but notice if Q and pi are related, and if square root of lambda plus one is the Legendre symbol of lambda plus one, then McCarthy's theorem, where lambda over lambda plus one gives a square of the period, exactly the same argument gives us the square of the trace of Frobenius for exactly the same models. And I think that's a very beautiful theory. So using this theory, we could turn to the question of what are the limiting distrib distributions of these hypergeometric functions? Why are we motivated to do that? Because we now see that these hypergeometric functions are encoding traces of Frobenius. And as I said, I wanted to go in an orthogonal direction to what others had done. So I want to study Sato Tate for these functions. So what is the limiting distri distribution of uh, the renormalized values of the two F1s? Well, we prove that for every interval A less than B in the interval from negative two to two, the proportion of lambdas in a fixed finite field. So now I'm, I'm, I'm studying the distribution of the values of this function where lambda is arbitrarily chosen essentially out of the P to the R values. So instead of studying a fixed elliptic curve, I'm studying them all. I'm studying all of the genre some curves uh, in, in this finite field. So out of all of those curves, we're gonna compute their trace of Frobenius and we're gonna count when that special value is in the interval from A to B. Their P to the R values and our theorem is that as P goes to infinity, this proportion tends to one over two pi times the square of the integral of four minus T squared. In other words, it's semicircular again. This is exactly what Sato and Tate prove for a fixed elliptic curve if P goes to infinity. And so what our theorem says, if you pick a large finite field and study all the Legendre normal curves in that family, so in particular for experts, those are the curves with Z2, Z2 structure, then the same theorem holds. So in a way, it's a different aspect of Sato Tate where we refine Sato Tate, where we require a specific subgroup for the FQ points and you can do some numerics and you can see it happen on a computer. In terms of random matrices, if you're aware of that connection, it's this. We've, our theorem can be restated as proving that the two F1 functions uh, have a distribution that mimics um, the, 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 the distribution of the traces of random matrices in the Lie group SU2. So literally what we're proving is that two nth moments of these integrals defined by Haar measure equal these limiting values of the two nth moments uh, normalized of these functions. So how to think of this? If you're aware of how people use orthogonal polynomials as explicit uh, generators for structures of integrals against measures, what I want you to be thinking now is that the two F1 functions really should be the appropriate functions for characterizing uh, integrals against the Haar measure for SU2. So let's go up one dimension. Let's go to three F2. What is the limiting distribution of these renormalized values? So you'll notice that this three is the same as this three. That will be typical for all theorems for hypergeometric functions. If you study the variation of n, fn minus one, your, your normalization will be in the interval from negative n, n to the n. There's a reason why I don't want to cut it down to the unit interval. And our theorem is very different. Choose an arbitrary interval a to b within negative three to three. And let's count out of all the special values, 3F2 of lambda, the lambdas are moving. 
Let's only count those where this function lands in the sub interval A to B. The proportion of those, namely this count divided by P to the R, when you let P goes to infinity, also captures a distribution. It's one over four pi times the integral of a function F. All right. So that proves that some, some distribution is well-defined. What is it? It's this ugly thing. <coughs> if this doesn't capture your imagination, I don't blame you. So they say a picture is worth a thousand words. So let me give the thousand words in two words. So as the next illustration will show, the integral on the right has a lovely incarnation. Instead of giving you the semicircle like we've now seen for elliptic curves in many different aspects. It turns out that these three F2s cut out a distribution. So the integral from negative three to three of this thing is one looks very, very different. We call this the Batman distribution. Um, well, I think you see it. What does this say in terms of random matrices? Well, it says that the three F2 functions really should be over finite fields, somehow the right functions for parameterizing distributions related to the orthogonal group, the real orthogonal group O3. So, um, so uh, my time is short, so let me just move on. So I was very excited to see um, th this graph because um, it's certainly not what we expected. And we've now done more calculations for higher dimensional um, hypergeometric functions. And this is the beginning of a very, very beautiful theory uh, that will be uh, hopefully in the long run populated with some very beautiful pictures, one for every dimension. Dimension two is a semicircle, dimension three is the Batman, and, and, and that's what today's talk is about. How do we go about proving our formulas? Well, there's nothing new here. It boils down to computing moments. If we can write down very precise formulas for the moments of these functions, we will be well on our way. So what we wish to do is determine asymptotics as Q goes to infinity for these moments. And if you can recognize the asymptotics that you prove as, as in the form of the expected value of the nth powers of a random variable x that has the claim distribution, well, then you will have proven your theorem. So the task is always to compute asymptotics for the moment and try to discover whether or not the distribution you've ended up with is one that naturally corresponds to some, some group of random matrices. All right, so this is where the class numbers come in. It turns out that the formulas here for the nth power moment. So we're summing over the nth powers of these hypergeometric functions. It turns out that there's a closed formula in every case. What are the parameters? The parameters are Q, what finite field Q are you, FQ are you working with? And what is the power M? And as a function of Q and M, we have a formula. These formulas end up being very complicated, uh, but this is where the class numbers come in. They are explicit weighted sums of class numbers. So to make this precise, and I will show you some of those explicit formulas, let me just take a moment <clears throat> to recall definitions. Although I, I assume today earlier, maybe Katrin and others already, already included this. So if negative D is a discriminant, I'd like H of minus D to be a negative discriminant. I'd like H of minus D to be the class number of the corresponding imaginary quadratic order. And the Hurwitz class numbers for this discriminant are easily described group the theoretically. <clears throat> Capital H of D will be the sum of these class numbers as you sum over all of the orders that are, uh, that, um, uh, <clears throat> that are, are in the maximal order but contain O. <clears throat> and so if minus D is a fundamental discriminant, the Hurwitz class number is just literally the class number of the imaginary quadratic field. And sometimes the Hurwitz class numbers are modified. I think this is generally how most people define them. They're defined to be the same sum after having divided by uh, the automorphs, the automorphisms, number of half the automorphisms of uh, these groups. The two F1 moments are then given by beautiful formulas. 
But there is no single formula. I regret to say that, the, the, that there are several cases. So one case is this. Suppose R is odd. So if R is odd, that's the same as this. So I forgot to say this. FQ is FP to the R, right? So R means Q is P to the R where R is odd. If R is odd and M is even, then the nth power moment is this elementary closed sum of class numbers, where you are summing over class numbers whose uh, of the form FQ minus S squared, weighted by this S to the M. <coughs> which S's do you only sum over those S's which are congruent to Q plus one mod four? <laughs> if R and M are both even, you have basically the same formula, but there is a potential error term that comes in that's related to um, the super singular locus. If you uh, don't know what that means, let me just say that that relates to choices of values of S that might be zero. And for Qs that are one mod four and M is odd, and there's a similar formula, and there's a very simple formula. If Q is three mod four and M is odd, the nth power moment is just the number one. All right. So, to prove these theorems is really an exercise in the study of elliptic curves. Doering proved that every elliptic curve over Q has complex multiplication. Now, that might sound funny, uh, so let me be more precise. Doering proved that every elliptic curve over Q has complex mu multiplication over a finite field. So as the finite fields vary, what the ring of complex multiplication does is it, it most likely will move. It will generally vary with the characteristic. When we say that an elliptic curve itself globally has complex multiplication, it's a situation, the very rare situation where this complex multiplication is fixed, in, fixed without, uh, uh, is fixed, doesn't move with the finite field. And so our proof really just relies on understanding this Doering correspondence um, in the context of our varieties. So this is quite well known. If G is an abelian group and S is one of these admissible traces of Frobenius, you can define a function IGSQ to be a count, a count of the number of isomorphism classes of an elliptic curve over FQ, where the FQ points contains G as a group and where the number of points on the elliptic curve is related to S by this standard formula, the one that we've been using throughout. The connection to class numbers is this famous theorem of Scope that makes Doering's lifting lemma explicit. And it's the statement that in general, that these functions I are class numbers. So in particular, if you demand that the direct product of, of a cyclic group Zn with itself lives inside an elliptic curve over FQ, and you want to count how many isomorphism classes of elliptic curves have that property, well, he proves this formula. It's really just a class number. So to sketch our two F1 moments, we just have to recognize a few standard facts about Legendre form elliptic curves. One, all Legendre form elliptic curves contain Z2 cross Z2 as a subgroup. For each lambda, there are generally five other ghost values of Legendre curves that uh, are isomorphic over the algebraic closure. There's a six to one map. And so what we're discovering is, <coughs> is that the two F1 functions are, are really somehow organizing these Legendre elliptic curves in terms of their FQ isomorphism classes. And if you work that out very carefully and then compute the nth power moments and apply Scope's theorem, you get our power moments. It's really the statement that the sum of hypergeometric functions captures the organization of elliptic curves that contain Z2 cross Z2. Now, the similar thing holds for the three F2s, although it's a little bit more complicated, right? So in this case, what we want to make use of instead of the K3 surfaces is this formula that I proved that shows that the three F2s give the squares of the traces of Frobenius for the other elliptic curves called the Clausen curves. <laughs> And just like the Legendre forms organize elliptic curves, 
These Claussen curves also organize elliptic curves that contain Z2 as a subgroup with some other interesting properties. And uh, a minor tweak of what we said before says that the even power moments, which are the only ones that are relevant, right? If I'm gonna compute the mth power moment of 3F2, it's like summing up the mth powers of these squares. So I only need to compute the even power moments of, the, of them. And in analogy, if you work out the elementary theory of elliptic curves, you can compute the even power moments and the twisted even power moments uh, arguing, as I said above. Then if you use Scoff's theorem, you can then reinterpret these various isomorphism counting functions with even more complicated formulas involving the class numbers. Let me spare you of that, but that's the idea. So if you want to prove our asymptotic formulas, what we need to do is something like this. We need to take our explicit theoretical moment formulas for these functions, which are complicated weighted sums of class numbers, and we have to somehow do analysis on it. So from the geometry of elliptic curves and from these beautiful theorems about these functions, we have to turn to a little bit of analytic number theory to analyze the formulas that we have obtained. So uh, this makes intersection with some stuff I used to think about quite deeply related to the mock theta functions. This is the theory of the harmonic Moss forms. And perhaps the first harmonic Moss form that one might study if you didn't study the work of Ramanujan would be Zagier's generating function for the class numbers. Here they are. So the Hurwitz class numbers, the generating function when decorated with these gadgets is a function called H that Don proved is a very special kind of modular form, a weight, what's called a weight three halves harmonic Moss form. These are a little bit more intricate than the classical modular forms, but if you're familiar with the theory of modular forms, let me proceed as if they were modular forms but you'll know that underneath the proofs, there have to be some calculations that have to be dealt with to make that pretend into a proof. So the toy problem that we need to study uh, goes back to the work of Eichler. Eichler was able to sum class numbers and get a closed formula. And if you remember from earlier, a few slides ago, I had sums like this, except they were like, h star of q minus s squared over four, right? They were a little bit more complicated than this, and there were congruence conditions that I had to impose on s. So the key to understanding our asymptotics is to understand a general theory that begins with the task of trying to explain Eichler's toy problem. So typical of the type of expression that we have to consider asymptotics for is something like this. Suppose you have a finite field FQ. We want to sum over S's that satisfy a congruence, the corresponding class numbers weighted by S to the M. So even without the congruences and with, even without this divisibility, Eichler's toy problem is like where M is zero. We need this for all M. So how do we do that? Well, let's it turns out that this has been a very, very pop, this kind of calculation has been a very popular topic uh, over the last six or seven years. So uh, Henri Cohen in the early 1970s developed what are called the Cohen brackets. These are differential operators that take a pair of modular forms and writes down and assembles a linear form in products of their derivatives that is again modular. And if you tinker around with these formulas, you can get the kinds of equations I described a moment ago. In the 1970s, Henri Cohen developed some conjectures, which Katrin student Michael Mertens, who was recently a postdoc with me, in his thesis undertook as the main goal of his thesis to prove these asymptotics. And so I want to make it very clear that if you want to see the first important work on uh, along the lines of what I'm describing here, the paper that we wrote isn't the one for it. You would want to read Michael Merton's papers. So as I said, there's something called the ranking Cohen bracket. If you're given two modular forms, F and G, not necessarily holomorphic. And let me not go into 
what that means when you have a harmonic MOS form, which is non-holomorphic. Just imagine applying the differential operators to them as if they were modular and, and, and you would be good because we have a beautiful theory of differential operators on harmonic MOS forms. Uh, the, the main gist is that given F and G, modular forms of weights K and L, this gadget gives you a function that satisfies the modular transformation laws for this higher weight. So to obtain our moment asymptotics, what we need to do is try to figure out how to assemble harmonic MOS forms and modular forms that encode these coefficients. How do I make this appear as a coefficient of a modular form? And we're very happy that you don't have to work very hard to do it. Starting with Zagier's class number generating function H from the previous slide <clears throat> and the first two theta functions you might ever encounter in number theory, the classical one theta and the cube of the eta function. What you can do is you can consider the ranking code brackets of H with theta and H with eta cubed to write down two infinite sequences of harmonic MOS forms. And let me spare you the gory details, but I just want you to imagine that if we've done that, then you're writing down generating functions whose coefficients involve the sums that are our power moments of class numbers. Now, it's not as simple as that. These are very, very messy formulas, but if you do it right, you'll discover that the main terms asymptotically in the functions that you want um, pop out. So you want to carefully tease out the sums that we need. This follows along the lines of the kinds of calculations that Michael Mertens did with minor modifications. And what you then do is you consider the holomorphic projections of these gadgets, which end up being honest to goodness modular forms of various weights as indicated here. And to make a very long story short, let me just say at the end, you will win. It turns out that the asymptotics of these holomorphic modular forms very closely resemble the, the holomorphic, the, the asymptotics of the functions that you indeed wish to study. The variance is very small. And uh, uh, if you work in a theory of modular forms, you'll then know that there are many tools at your disposal for computing asymptotics. And we need Deline's theorem. We need the theory of Eisenstein series and standard bounds for L functions to finally tie up our loose ends. So what I like about this is I got to talk to you about elliptic curves and K3 surfaces, how they are tied together through the theory of hypergeometric functions and how that gives rise to pictures like circles and Batman. But then at the end of the day, because this was a conference on class numbers, it's even more pleasing that proving all of those things really requires uh, a manipulation of the class numbers that are the topic of this conference. So after all of that stuff, we get our theorems that say we can prove our asymptotic formulas for the moments. And very happily, we get Catalan numbers in the case of the even moments for these functions. For the three F2s, you get these weighted sums of Catalan numbers, which is still very delightful. And uh, my time is running short, but this is the easy part. Once you've computed moments, if you've had a good course on probability theory, you've already familiar with this sort of thing. Once you have the moments and you can recognize your moments as being the um, uh, expected values of powers of a fixed random variable, when you've done that, and that's what I'm just flipping through here, if you do all of that, you end up with the theorem that you want. In the case of the three F2s, it's rather intricate because that Batman function isn't one that um, I had seen before. And so, as you would expect, some manipulation was necessary. The main manipulation being some formulas for other hypergeometric functions. So to conclude, just to summarize, uh, we have, uh, and what I propose uh, as a field of research is to study the distributions of all of Green's hypergeometric functions with various parameters. As the number of parameters and types of parameters vary, how do these distributions vary? Our work only considers the first two cases, 
with the simplest of characters, the 2F1 with quadratic characters and the 3F2s with quadratic characters. And already in those cases, you either get the semicircle, which is Sato Tate in its full glory, but refined to Legendre curves. And in 3F2, you get Batman. So as I said, uh, this is ongoing work by Hassan and others here and Neelam here at U University of Virginia. Uh, and I hope over time, we will have much more to report to you uh, when I, uh, in terms of other kinds of functions. So in closing, I think these pictures are very beautiful. Here in the United States, we're about to celebrate Halloween. This is the very funny holiday where kids dress up in costumes and get candy um, for playing tricks on adults. Uh, as the department chairman here at the University of Virginia, I get to be a kid again. So I'm hosting the math department's Halloween party and uh, not, not much of a huge secret. Um, I will be dressing up as a theorem in character and I'm sure you can tell that I'm not gonna dress up as a semicircle. All right, all right. So with that, I thank you for your attention. And as I said, we've been delighted to have Neelam here at Virginia. And so maybe she will be the beginning of a pipeline. Thank you. Yeah, so let's thank uh, Professor Kenono. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, 